Welcome and good morning. It's good to see you today in God's house. Thank you for coming for this time of worship and as we think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Uh, this week we have an opportunity to give thanks uh, to the Lord for all he does and certainly we should thank him all the time. But this week as we take an opportunity to especially thank him, I want you to remember just to spend as much time giving, giving thanks to him as much as possible. All right, if you would please bow your heads as we pray. Father, we're grateful for this time of worship today as we think about the goodness of your love, and it gives us reason to stop and, and praise you and thank you just for who you are, and we're, we're just uh, blessed with this uh, place of worship. We're blessed to be in a country that still has freedoms. We're blessed to be in this part of the country, Lord, and we're just uh, grateful most of all and blessed most of all by the Savior who has given us life everlasting. I pray today that as we think about these truths, that you would just continue to help us and encourage us to have even more reasons to thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand again, and the hymn number is 637. Come, ye thankful people, come. Turn over to page number 39, 39, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Your King. 
Let's all join now as we uh, turn to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you so much for this time we have to come into your house to praise and worship you. And we lift you up above all. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us. As it's already been stated this morning, we have so much to be thankful for here. We're thankful for the needs that you provide for us, Lord, the, our food and clothing and homes and the necessities of life that you've so richly provided for us. But, Lord, you do so much more than give us what we need. You give us so much of what we want. And you protect us, Lord, by not giving us everything we want. We just thank you that you're sovereign, and we thank you that, that if we let you, that you will be in control of our lives, and that you will keep us on the path that you would have for us, and that you will guide us. And Father, of all the things to be thankful for, we just thank you for your guidance. We also thank you for your love, how terrible it would be to be in a situation where we were unloved. But Lord, no matter what happens around us, we have the confidence that, that though everything fall apart and everyone forsake us, that we still have you. And that's enough. But in addition to that, Lord, you give us so much more. Now, Father, as we go through the rest of our service today, we just pray that you would... Uh, Make our hearts soft, make our minds keen, help us to listen well and to learn as we have the opportunity this morning to draw closer to you through greater knowledge of you. Be with our pastor as he gives us the sermon and help him to present it in a way that you would see fit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you, thank you, choir, or ensemble. You did a tremendous job. Let me ask you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 136 this morning. Psalm 136, and I'll be reading the first three verses, but we will be looking at the, the entire chapter. Psalm 136, beginning at verse number, number one. Give thanks to the Lord for... He is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. And may God bless the reading of his word. As one wise man once told me, there's, there's really only two kinds of prayers. There's a Lord help and Lord thanks. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help my family. Lord, help my country. Or thank you, Lord, for my family, my country, and the many blessings. So those are the two kind of prayers. And so we see here in this passage of Scripture, this text in Psalm 136, the psalmist, he's, he's encouraging God's people to freely give praise and thank the Lord for His goodness. He is he's challenging us, he's exhorting us and encouraging us to give thanks. And we give thanks to God based upon his character, that God is a good God. God epitomize, epitomizes, he defines, and he clarifies all that is good. When we think of God, we can truly say he is good. The Bible describes God as good. And so my question for you today, or one of the many questions, is how has God been good to you? Now the Bible describes God who, who allowed Joseph to be imprisoned, Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be thrown into a fire, Paul to be beaten, Peter to be executed, and his history records that John was boiled in oil. Yet the Bible describes God as good, and sometimes we have a difficult time making the distinction, and I want to try to make that distinction for you today, because it's not our measure. It was the Pharisee in the New Testament who, who in his prayer praised his own goodness. He said, oh Lord, thank, me, thank you that I'm not like everyone else. So our goodness is often measured on the backdrop against what we perceive as good, or our personal goodness uh, uh, by the, you know, comparing ourselves to our fellow man. But in reality, our goodness, no matter how uh, self-absorbed it may be, is inadequate to describe the word good when we're talking about the Lord God Almighty and what good really means. When we think someone is good, we naturally assume that they're going to give us all the things we want or bless us with all the things we want. And, and that's just not the case as we see God who is good, who sometimes withholds things from us and sometimes even allows difficulties in our life. See, occasionally he allows bad things to happen to us, not because he's not good, but because he is good. And he wants us to understand that even in those difficult times, he is good. And even though the situation may seem, from our perspective, something that's less than good, we understand that God still is good, even though we may not see the good in it yet. At this point in time, so we need to look at things from the perspective of the Scripture, from the eyes of the Lord God Almighty, to understand why He is the measure of good and why He is described as good. God is His, His good nature. It's epitomized by His mercy. Our mercy, mercy fluctuates according to the situation. And his, his mercy, on the other hand, is constant. It's evenly dispersed. His steadfast love and His mercy, they endure from everlasting to everlasting. So we... We need to understand that even, even though things may not seem the way we want, that God is still a good God. God's mercy is perfect. His goodness is perfect. God's mercy is essential for salvation. God's mercy is essential to help us as Christians to persevere in this Christian life and to live in this world. So God's mercy is therefore essential. And so we need to give thanks to Him for His mercy. So the psalmist describes three things. Three major things to thank God for. We thank God because He's good. He's the best of the best and He's Lord of lords. 
He is far above any other thing, any other item, anything else, any other God that we may have in this world. So we need to give him thanks. But he also gives us a few more. First, he, he, we must give him thanks because he's creator. In verses 4 through 9, the psalmist describes this fact that God created all things. That means everything. We praise him for what he's able to do. He alone does great wonders. He alone has fashioned this world and, and spoke this world into order and existence. He did this on his own. No one prompted him. No one helped him. No one aided him. God did this all on his own. And in this idea here of, of his works, in verse number four, this fact that, that we give him thanks to him who alone does great wonders, it implies this fact that, that he follows through with his promises. He does precisely what he says he's going to do. And sometimes, because he's a good God, and, and we understand that because he fulfills his promises, sometimes we go through difficulties as well. But he created all things. It's our privilege to be able to thank him for his work in creation. Creation manifests his handiwork and his creativity. God built the universe, universe with wisdom. It's freely that we see here the Lord's creation. It, it, it manifests his work. His creation moves with precision and grace. The tides, they, they ebb and they flow. The birds, they sing and they soar. The planets revolve with zeal. And all bring thanks and praise to the Creator. So we can thank Him for His handiwork. One author wrote the creation song, and these are the words. He wraps Himself in light, as with a garment. He spreads out the heavens and walks on the wings of the wind. He sends forth the springs from the valleys. They flow between the mountains. The birds of the air dwell by the waters, lifting their voices in song, singing glory, glory, glory to the Lamb, all praises and honor forever. He made the moon for its season. The sun knows its setting. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. And we see the handiwork of God around him. Verse 6 tells us we can thank God for the heavens that he's given to us. Verse 7 tells us we can thank him for the stars that are above. Verse 8 tells us we need to thank him for the sun in the sky. Verse 9 tells us to thank him for the moon. The sun rules the day and the moon rules the night. So we can thank God for his creation, his handiwork in creation. We thank God that he created this nature around us that surrounds us that we can enjoy, that we can and enjoy and appreciate. We thank him for all that he's done for us. When I think about that, and we arguably live in one of the most beautiful places in the country, in the world. And certainly we can go and we can look at the beauty of the oceans. We can see the vastness of our country. We see the vastness of the world. There's, uh, there's uh, wastelands that are still beautiful in their own way. And this is part of his handiwork, his creation that we can thank him for. Do we thank him for his creation? So we not only give thanks for his creation because God is the creator, we give thanks because he is Savior. Verses 10 through 16 describes the God of salvation. So we, we give him thanks for our release from spiritual slavery to freedom in him. The psalmist here he presents the worshiper with, with reasons, more reasons to thank God. He describes the Exodus. The Exodus was a pivotal event in the nation of Israel, in their life, because they were slaves. They were slaves to the taskmasters in Egypt. They were not their own. They, they lived their lives at the, at the request and the demand of their taskmasters. So God displayed his mighty power and his love for his people by, by releasing them from this captivity. God in his mercy toward Israel struck down the firstborn of Egypt while judgment fell on others. It's important for us to understand that God showed mercy to his people. The world around, it, around them seemed to be going to in a desperate place, dark place, deathly place. And God showed his mercy to his people. 
God brought his people out of Egypt. The lowest computation in the numbers, there were some 600,000 men, roughly, uh, they say 2 million people that, that left during this time of the Exodus. Some say 2 million, some say as high as 5.5 million people or 6 million people. This week I thought about that number and the, the population in South Carolina is roughly 5.5 million, 5.6 or 7 million. Can you imagine taking a, a group of people the size of the state of South Carolina through the wilderness and just the logistics that were involved in taking care of these individuals? Yet God did this. He raised up leaders. He raised up people who would, who would lead and guide them. He provided for them in the wilderness. And we hear the story of how God took his people from this desperate place and he brought them through this vast wasteland to a, a promised land. So we see that verse 12 tells us that with outstretched hands he, he divided the Red Sea. They came to a point in their journey where they had, had to cross the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea. There are some who would say that the Bible talks about the Reed Sea, which was just a few inches deep, but this is the Red Sea, as the Scripture teaches us, and how he, he pushed it back with just the, the breath of his mouth, just the wind of the sky, and he pushed this apart so that God's people could go through to safety. He brought them to safety. When the enemy pursued, he allowed the waters to engulf Pharaoh's army and drown them. You see, God led his people through the wilderness and to the Promised Land, and so the psalmist reminds us here, and he reminds us in other places that even though we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is always with us because we are his people. And we have every reason to trust him and praise him and to, to thank him. We thank him because he's our savior. See, the psalmist said to thank him for this redemption because what, what he did for the children of Israel is symbolic and pictures what he has done for us. They were in captivity to, to this taskmaster. And you and I, we were in captivity to sin. That was our heavy taskmaster, the one who brutalized us and held us down and tried to destroy us and would defeat us if at all possible. Yet, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, which we've heard songs about this morning, that washes us clean. We're taken from the land of spiritual slavery through the redemption of Jesus Christ to freedom. See, this is how God leads, as one pastor put it. He leads his people, he leads them out, and he leads them through, and he leads them into. He leads us out of sin, through the world, and he ultimately leads us into heaven. That is why we can give him thanks. Salvation is when he takes this cold, desperate heart of ours this bankrupt, God-hating heart. And he, he reaches down from eternity and he reaches into our lives and he plucks us and he calls us his own and he saves us. And he changes us and we follow him. That is the greatest blessing we can thank him for. See, God provides for our greatest spiritual need, our greatest need of all, which is eternal life. Sometimes we think that the, the needs of this life are vital and they are. But what is most important and most needed in the life of any individual is that they meet Christ as Lord and Savior, that their eternal soul gets saved. And this is what we can thank God for because Jesus has provided this for us. So we not only thank Him for salvation, but we also, third point is we thank Him for His provision. In verses 17 through 25, so we, we give thanks to God as our provider. You see, we have an inheritance Heaven is what we're all moving toward. For the children of Israel, they understood this as the promised land, that that was the land of promise. For you and I as Christians, we're moving toward our promised land, which is heaven. We have this inheritance that is, that is waiting for us when we pass from this life into the next. We transition. We see here in verses 17 through 25 that Israel was instructed to thank God for the conquest of their enemies along this journey for the freedom that they received when they left Egypt, for their journey to the promised land and how God guided and led them. In 1623, Governor William Bradford proclaimed, made a proclamation. This was three years after the pilgrims had settled at Plymouth. He writes, he made his proclamation, to all ye pilgrims, inasmuch as the Father has given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, 
squashes, and garden vegetables, and has made the forests to abound with game, and the sea with fish and clams. And inasmuch as he has protected us from the raids of the savages, has spared us from the pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience, now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all ye meeting house on ye hill between the hours of nine and ten on the day time on Thursday, November ye 29th of the year of our Lord, 1623, and the third year, and this was the third year since ye pilgrims landed on ye Plymouth Rock, there to listen to ye pastor and to render thanksgiving to ye almighty God for all his blessings. And that was the proclamation that we still make today, that we give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. We set aside this day to thank him, not just for the provision that we have in this life, but because of what he has done for us, how he has given us eternal life how he has brought us through in this life, how we can call on him and we can pray, help me, Lord, or thank you, Lord. And this week it, it must be a we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. So he remembers, as the psalmist tells us here in this passage of Scripture, he remembers us. He remembers us in our difficulties. He remembers us in our problems and what is going on. He remembers us. And we should remember God the instant he remembers us. He remembers us in our lowest state. He takes note of our situation. When things are at their worst, he remembers us and he takes care of us. When we take care of our own situation, we can do this. But when we allow him and we trust him to fix our situation, he, he does a far better job than we do. I don't know about you, but we, me, I have a tendency to mess things up. Our trajectory sometimes is far too low. And so we need to trust him and we need to look to him and allow him to do what he chooses to do. When he remembers, he takes control and he takes pity over our situation. And when he remembers, he recalls our petitions, those prayers that we make before him. We must always be people of prayer, bringing our petitions to the Lord. Although the psalmist tells us that he remembers us, one thing that we need to understand, one thing that he fails to remember Isaiah 43, 25 says this, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So for those who have been forgiven, for those who he has forgiven, those individuals, he remembers their sin no more. What a comforting truth, what a comforting fact, knowing that, that all that I've done, as I've brought those things and I've confessed them to the Lord, he remembers them no more. The Bible says he casts them as far as the east is from the west. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. And so we understand that as we look to the Lord God Almighty, and he, we remember, and he remembers all the good things, all our needs, that as we confess our sins and we walk into this relationship of salvation, he forgets all of our sin. He remembers them no more, as the scripture teaches so we give thanks to God as our provider. He provides for our needs in times of calamity, in times of bounty. James 1.17 says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So God is the giver of all the good gifts. That means even though things may not seem perfect, even though things might be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like, like Peter and like Paul and like John, we might be going through the fiery furnace. Even in those times, we can trust God because He's a good God. And we can trust Him because He, he loves us and He provides for our needs. He takes care of us even in those times of calamity. Verse 25 says this is not just for, for us, but verse 25 says, He who gives food to, to all flesh... There's this concept in the Bible that, this, that he provides the natural blessings of this world to everyone. So everyone in this world is a recipient of the goodness and the blessings of God. We call this common grace. Now common grace doesn't mean that they're saved. What common grace means is this, that on some level God is blessing them. And there will be coming a day. When, co when the common grace is pulled back and pulled away. But in the meantime, as long as we're dwelling here on this earth, we need to understand that we and the world around us are the recipients of God's goodness. Common grace is God's favor. 
And it's a gift given to those who will not finally be saved. That means there are some who are recipient who will not be saved. So when we speak of common grace, we're speaking of God's kindness to all the people during their time on the earth, regardless of their status with him. So everyone in this world has reason to praise and to give thanks to God. So this week, we all stand in thanksgiving to the Lord God Almighty for what he has done for us. Verse 26 is the conclusion. The psalmist said this, Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to God. He is the God of the universe. He is the God of heaven. He is the God of our broken and lonely and empty hearts. He is the God of this world. So we spent our time this morning thinking about how to be thankful and the reasons to be thankful. We need to be thankful to God. We, we thank Him because He's good. He's a gracious, He's a loving God. And He gives common grace so that someone might say, there may be something to this God, this character that we hear people talking about. Maybe that is who we need to be putting our trust and hope in, not in the world around us. So He is good. His love endures forever. So how great is God's love? How great is His mercy? You can be pardoned from your sin. You can be forgiven for your sin. And that is the goodness and the graciousness of God. Remember, remember this, that His love and His mercy endure forever. He has provided for His creation, for us to enjoy. His love has provided salvation for you. And His love has given provision to all the world around us to sustain life, happiness, and to, en to enjoy. So this is the challenge this week. Not to, not to get caught up in politics and the dreariness of it. Not to get caught up in the things that are going on even in your household. But to remember the goodness of the Lord God Almighty. Because they're his goodness supersedes all that is going on. So we have much, many reasons to be thankful. We have many reasons to celebrate Thanksgiving. So this week, I hope for you that you will have a happy Thanksgiving. So this morning as we close in prayer, we're just going to have one song of decision, one song or one verse. And in just a moment as we as we depart, I want you to make sure that you, you make a decision this, this morning to be thankful this week. If you haven't been thankful all this last week or all this last year, be thankful to the Lord even in the time we're going through now. So if you would, please bow your heads as we pray. Father, I pray that you would help us today to remember your goodness, your mercy, your great love, your bounty, and sometimes your rebuke, sometimes the difficult things that we go through. Even in those times, Lord, we can give you thanks. Help us, Father, this day to be thankful. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. If you would please stand as we sing. Five hundred forty seven, five hundred forty seven.
Remember the challenge to be thankful no matter what. If you would, please bow your heads as we're dismissed. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning to cultivate a thankful heart. I know it's difficult at times, so help us remember today, Lord, as we leave this place, to make it a point to be thankful no matter what's going on. We pray these things today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.